Mr. Speaker, I rise to give an account of the performance of our nation's economy in 2019 and the goals we intend to achieve in 2020. We have entitled this budget statement, Growth and Development for the Benefit of All, because that single phrase encapsulates the objectives we are purposefully and vigorously implementing. The people of Antigua and Barbuda resoundingly put their faith in our administration to do the job of rebuilding a broken economy and improving the lives of our people. Our economic performance is repaying that trust with dividends. And Mr. Speaker, I would like to turn to the macroeconomic performance of our country. According to the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, our economy grew in 2019 by an astounding 6.2%. We far surpassed almost every country in this hemisphere, including the United States and Canada. This is cause for pride, pride in ourselves as a small nation that puts its shoulder to the wheel and its nose to the grindstone. It is cause for commendation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our people have even greater cause for pleasure because our remarkable growth in 2019 followed equally impressive growth of 7.4% in 2018. Indeed, over the last five years, we have real average economic growth and expansion of 5%. In fact, no other country in this hemisphere matched that outstanding record of sustainable growth during the past five years. Our economy continues to confound those who try to talk it down. We are rewarding the trust of the people of our country. And that's a trust that we take very seriously. And we will never betray your trust. We are delivering on our promises. And as we say from time to time, promise made. <laughs> and the delivery is measurable. It is evident. And it is certainly beneficial. Growth in the economy has brought more jobs, more permanent employment, and higher wages. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report to this nation that as a result of the economic growth that our government has delivered, unemployment in our country is down to a single digit number for the first time since 2014. Our unemployment has been reduced to just over 8%. Let me repeat it. Unemployment has been reduced to a single digit figure of just over 8%. That too is cause for commendation. It is cause for pride. We are putting our people back in work, back in jobs, and back to having money in their pockets. And that is why we eliminated personal income tax several years ago. Mr. Speaker, I have no doubt that there will be some outside of this Honorable House who will dispute that we have so dramatically reduced unemployment from the unacceptable 25% that we inherited in 2014. They will reject it because they will be too ashamed to confess that it was they who put our people into unemployment and 10 long years of poverty. They will reject it because they will not have the good grace and decency to admit that we had to turn their calamity into opportunity and their degradation into development. But 
the figures speak for themselves. Data available from the Social Security Board confirms that the total number of registered employees has increased for six successive years. Further, while the number of registered employees was 42,682 in 2018, the number climbed to 43,535 in 2019. That, honorable members, is progress. It is advancement. It is delivering for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. That is repaying the people's investment in our government with interest. Mr. Speaker, I have not yet painted the full picture of the benefits that have been delivered for all the people of Antigua and Barbuda, and I will certainly do so. But first of all, let me address the high income and human development that our people are enjoying. Antigua and Barbuda boasts one of the highest per capita income GDP in the Caribbean. And according to the 2019 United Nations Human Development Report, has the second highest human development index among the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union countries. GDP per capita has risen from 2,000 United States dollars at the time of our independence to almost 20,000 United States dollars today. Antigua and Barbuda now stands as a high income country in the world's ranking and our people's average income is among the highest in the Western Hemisphere. That too is cause for commendation. Let's hear it to the people of Antigua and Barbuda. You see, these are not the successes of just the members of my cabinet. These are the successes of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And we must celebrate our successes. Mr. Speaker, this significant improvement in the average income of our workforce does not mean that pockets of poverty and income inequality no longer exist in our society. The reality is they do. But we are tackling the issue vigorously. It should be clear that our government says what it means and means what it says. We do not play games. And let it be recognized that success in creating better and higher incomes for people is already visible in our population so that people are now living better, they are living healthier, and they are living longer. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations Index places Antigua and Barbuda's human development rating above the average for Latin America and the Caribbean and way above the average in Asia and Africa. And those facts paint a picture of an economy that is steadily growing, of unemployment that is continuously reducing, of more people doing progressively better, and of a society that is increasingly more confident and optimistic. ECLAC has projected that Antigua and Barbuda will be the second fastest growing economy in our hemisphere in 2020 with a growth rate of 6.5%. All other countries, except Guyana, are projected to grow by 4% or less. Mr. Speaker, I would like to spend some time to speak about our investment in education. We are resolved to limit poverty and to narrow the inequality in income by improving the skills and knowledge of more people to take advantage of higher paying jobs. We will not accept an economy where only a few do spectacularly well. That will not happen on our leadership. My government is determined to give every person who wants it, even members of the United Progressive Party, the opportunity to climb the ladder of self-improvement, yeah. to betterment, and to progress. We're an all-inclusive government. Yes. That is why we have placed such great emphasis on improving education and expanding access to all. We recognize that a better educated, better skilled, more knowledgeable people 
will not only benefit from the opportunities in a growing economy, they will also contribute to its widening and its strengthening. That is why we will invest tens of millions in the renovation of schools in Antigua and Barbuda. In tertiary education, transformation is marching through our country, propelled by my administration's egalitarian and progressive educational policies. We're determined to give every person, regardless of their social status, their color, their creed, a chance to satisfy themselves and by so doing, to compete with the best in the world. All competition is global, and we want to make sure that our people are globally competitive. That is why we're spending millions every year to provide 1,600 scholarships to young people to pursue various degree programs. And we have one of the highest per capita spend in education in the world. That is real commitment. And it is also why we have established the University Five Islands campus here in Antigua. And by the way, that was no easy feat. It required many months of hard work, negotiations, and the investment of nearly $20 million to facilitate a few hundred students to pursue a university education right here in Antigua and Barbuda. Mr. Speaker, by any measure, this is a monumental and historic accomplishment that will catapult economic and social transformation in this country. And I'll go as far as saying perhaps the most significant investment to have made by any government in the history of this country. Mr. P Mr. Speaker, the opportunity the Five Islands campus offers is open to all Antiguans and Barbudans by birth, by descent, by naturalization, residency, or by choice. I call on all within our shores to seize the chance in their own personal interests and the interests of our nation that will profit from the greater knowledge and skills they will gain. Mr. Speaker, I would like now to address the issue of entrepreneurial development, because this is also a fundamental part of our national developmental strategy. Access to higher education and to greater knowledge and skills is one way in which our government is working to ensure that we curb poverty and narrow income inequality. Another way is through the Entrepreneurial Development Fund, the EDF, which we launched in May of 2019. Its purpose is to provide low-cost funding and technical assistance to locally-owned businesses. To date, nearly $1 million in loans have been provided to local small businesses at the very low interest rate of 3%. In fact, the interest rate ranges between 1 and 3%. The businesses that have already benefited from the EDP or EDF include farming, bed and breakfast facilities, light manufacturing, real estate, and the tourism industry. Our firm intention is to leave no one in poverty once the person is willing to seize the opportunities to improve knowledge and skills. We're supplying real dollars to get small businesses into operation. Mr. Speaker, I now address the issue of debt management. It will be recalled that in 2014, when our government came to office, the ratio of debt to GDP was a frightening 102%. And by the way, that does not include a number of unbooked debts, including the 100 million plus that was owed to Half Moon Bay. It did not include the half a billion dollars that was owed to Petro Caribe. It did not include the 300 million dollars to resolve the ABI Bank. So if you had to adjust for those debts that were not accounted for, our debt to GDP would have been in a region of 150%.
That is the reality of what we inherited in 2014. However, I am pleased to inform this Honorable House that our nation's ratio of debt to GDP is now down to 69.1%. So when they say that we are borrowing excessively, again, the figures speak for themselves. In fact, that is a remarkable reduction of more than 33% in five years. And that 33% is based on their official figure of 104% in 2014. Now, by any independent measure, it is a tremendous accomplishment. And I remind you, these are the accomplishments of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. It's a collective effort. So we do not take sole responsibility as the executive for these successes. The objective set for countries of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union is 60% by 2030. And we are now within striking distance of meeting it. In fact, for 2020, the debt to GDP ratio is projected to be even lower at 64%. Mr. Speaker, undoubtedly, we will meet this target by the 2030 deadline established by the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union Monetary Council. <laughs> Notwithstanding the reduction in the debt to GDP ratio, the reality is the debt service requirement remains extremely high and daunting. We didn't create it but we have to fix it. And there's no quick fix. It will take time, it will take years. It may even take decades. That is the reality of the problem and the magnitude of the problem that we inherited. In 2019, debt service was 504.5 million compared to 412 million in 2018. In fact, there are a number of debts in which the principal payment were deferred for five years, that became due and payable within the last year. Now, we have also grown the economy significantly, and the new debt that we would have contracted, even though limited, would have been utilized for various projects such as rehabilitating roads, retrofitting street lighting, improving and expanding educational facilities, building tourism infrastructure, financing Liat and rebuilding following the passage of Hurricane Irma. So you can see that we have been borrowing on a limited basis, but we've been borrowing responsibly. That we were able to accomplish all that we have, despite high debt overhang, is yet another ind indicator of prudent fiscal management and sensible investment in growth and development for all. And let me make, the, make it abundantly clear that growth and development for all is not a cliche, it's not a slogan. Growth and development for all, for the benefit of all, is a policy and a practice of my administration. And that shall not change. We are firmly committed to building a healthy and wealthy, inclusive society. Mr. Speaker, our country has made it through some very, very hard times. We have picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off, and we are now remaking our economy. We have now laid a new foundation. And I say to the people of Antigua and Barbuda, a brighter future is now ours to embrace. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would like to now address the issue of investments and the tourism sector, which is clearly a stronger sector today. Our country's economic growth in 2019 was managed from two main platforms, foreign direct investment and tourism. The continuing foreign investment nails a lie to the preposterous claim of the idle, the malicious and the deceivers that this government is opposed to foreign investment. 
is nothing further from the truth. They wickedly twist our wish for fair deals that benefit our nation as much as it does the investor into grandiloquent lies, sophisticated lies. So when you hear the talk about sophistication, it is about sophisticated lies. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in eating. And I can say to you that this is certainly a delicious pudding. <laughs> Now, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the evidence is very clear. <coughs> Not only has our government welcomed fair and beneficial foreign investment, but foreign investment continues to be made with beneficial impact for every person in our country. Several of the investments, including the new Royalton Hotel, Hodges Bay Club, Hammock Cove, Canada Place, the Barbuda Ocean Club, among others, are obviously not only in their presence, but also in the beauty of the architecture. Also, Mr. Speaker, over 150 million United States dollars has been spent on the YIDA project thus far, and a further US 50 million to 100 million US dollars will be spent in 2020. The YIDA project is real. It's not a farce, Mr. Speaker. Without exception, our government has welcomed, encouraged, and facilitated all those foreign investments. In tourism, we enjoyed a 13% growth in arrivals in 2019. In 2019, we received a record-breaking record 309,000 stayover visitors for the year compared to 268,000 in 2018. And you should know too that at no point under the previous administration did they bring more than 250,000 tourists in a calendar year. But yet, they make the fraudulent claim that they have done better than my, my administration. Now, that was not only the only breakthrough that we recorded. In 2019, we oversaw the addition of 500 new hotel rooms, bringing our nation's room stock to over 3,500 rooms for the first time in our history. And by the way, we're not talking about motel rooms. We're talking about hotel rooms. <laughs> In fact, none of this happened accidentally. All of it was achieved by careful planning, imaginative, imaginative marketing, and strategic implementation. In the hands of bad policy makers and careless government, as well as corrupt governments, our tourism industry and our economy would not have so impressively improved and expanded. It would have declined and decayed, as happened between 2009 and 2014, when our economy contracted by 25%, putting thousands out of work and impoverishing our people. Lest you forget. The irony is, these so-called experts, in inverted commas, who wrecked our economy and our people's lives, are now seeking to cast themselves deceptively as our saviors. Can you imagine? In any event, we are determined that their days remain in the past, yes. never to be repeated. Yes. And I emphasize, never to be repeated. Yes. Distinguished Mr. Speaker, I now turn to revenue performance. Our goal is ensuring sustained socioeconomic development and advancement for the benefit of every man, woman, and child. And we are delivering it despite many challenges. In fact, one of those challenges, Mr. Speaker, is a reduction in the amount of taxes being paid in relation to the size of our economy, which has been growing exponentially. Now, given the impressive rate of economic growth, 
that we have accomplished, tax revenues should have multiplied proportionately. There is a direct correlation to increase economic activity and increase taxes. Simple arithmetic. But unfortunately, this has not happened. Clearly, there is significant evasion of tax payments or plain non-payment by various entities. And we're going to have to make examples of a few to ensure compliance. That is where we are today. Mr. Speaker, let me describe what has happened and what has been happening with government revenues and expenditure. For the year 2019, total revenue and grants to the government amounted to $847.5 million. That figure was a decline from $859.2 million in 2018. Should be going up, not down. For the most part, this $11.7 million decline was due to lower tax revenues. In 2018, tax revenue was $679.6 million, but it declined to $672 million in 2019. Again, as I said to you earlier, the revenue should be going up and not going down because the economy is getting bigger, it's expanding. Yet, as been clearly shown, our economy has grown steadily and our economic activity has been robust. We had every reason to expect that tax revenues would, ri would rise in line with evident economic growth. Alarmingly, although our economy is the second largest in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, and it enjoy fi uh, enjoyed far higher growth than most, our tax to GDP ratio is the lowest at 16%. Now we have a problem. Other economies that grew at much slower rate and are much smaller than ours had tax to GDP ratios above the currency union average of 20%, and some even collected more revenues than we did in nominal terms. Our non-tax revenues, principally the earnings from the Citizenship by Investment Program, the CIP program, performed much better than our tax revenues. This underscores the vital importance of the CIP to our economy. It brought in 98.9 million in 2019, almost $100 million, compared with 59.7 million in 2018. <laughs> Incidentally, Mr. Speaker, that is why our government has adhered to the highest standards of scrutiny of the applicants for our economic citizenship. It is why we are determined to grant citizenship only to those persons who pose no threat to the well-being of our country or to any other country in the world. It is also why when we discover any person who is legitimately wanted elsewhere, we will not allow that person to hide behind our citizenship to avoid the reach of the law. It will not happen. And that is why we have said to Michal Choksi, leave voluntarily, failing which he will certainly be legally expatriated or repatriated <laughs> to India. We have said to him that he is not wanted here. We have asked him to leave. And having exhausted all of the legal options, we will make sure that he is actually repatriated from whence he came. Mr. Speaker, the quality and integrity of our CIP is far too valuable to our economy and the well-being of our people to do anything but to uphold and implement the highest possible standards. And you know when it comes to good governance, we do not play. Very, very serious about good governance, especially when it comes to the abuse of public resources. I've said to all of my ministers, you abuse public resources and you're out. No compromise. Mr. Speaker, returning to the issue of revenue collection. The point is, our tax revenues are not at the level 
where every principle of finance and economics suggests they should be. And certainly in an economy that is growing as impressively as ours. And while revenue decreased, expenditure in 2019 was 1.02 billion, approximately the same amount as we spent in 2018. So you can see that a determined effort has been made to control expenditure. In other words, our government contained in 2019 all expenditure, except for capital spending, which we had to increase in order to deliver the infrastructural development the country requires. It should be noted, Mr. Speaker, that the bulk of government spending was on non-discretionary primary recurrent expenditure. Notice I said non-discretionary. We have no choice but to make these payments. And these are specifically wages and salaries, statutory contributions, goods and services, pensions and transfers, which amounted to $819 million. So when they say, where the money gone? They gone into paying debt and covering recurrent and capital expenditure, not in our pockets. Mr. Speaker, I want to make the fundamental point that the government cannot spend revenues that it has not received. It cannot build roads, deliver water, and supply other critical services if taxes are not paid. Consequently, new measures will be applied to ensure tax compliance and revenue collection. As I said before, we will make example of a number of people from this year and onwards. And we ask for self-regulation in paying your taxes. And it's not because we want to be harsh or draconian. But the reality is, if people pay the taxes, we would not have the revenue shortfalls that would have bedeviled the country for many years. And this is not a new problem. It has happened under the previous administration and even administrations before the previous one. We are not going to kick this problem down the road. We're dealing with it now. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Inland Revenue Department, the IRD, will launch a new user-friendly and interactive IRD website this year. It will provide critical information to the public and feature e-payment and e-filing functionalities. So taxpayers will be able to even pay their taxes online. We're making it easier for you to pay your taxes. You have no excuse. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the IRD will also intensify enforcement efforts, working with the Office of the Attorney General to take legal action for the recovery of outstanding taxes, particularly ABSD, property tax, and corporation tax. And I want to say to homeowners in particular, our property taxes are among the lowest in the world. In other countries, when you don't pay your property taxes, you lose your home. Why are you taking the government for granted? I say to you, pay your taxes. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> additionally, the Customs and Excise Division will use specialist equipment and tools donated by China and the United Kingdom Border Force to improve operational efficiency and revenue collection. We're going the extra mile to make sure we collect the revenue. The Comptroller and his team will also pursue new tactics to combat smuggling activities and safeguard our borders against illicit trade. And those who wantonly steal the revenue, we're going to put you in jail. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, finally, the IRD will implement a system of using forensic tax experts to improve the department's capacity to investigate tax evasion and profit shifting to reduce tax liability. And I want to warn the hoteliers in particular. We know that you're shifting your profits abroad. We know that you are underreporting your revenue. We know that you are cheating the revenue. And we're going to insist this year that you pay, failing which there will be consequences. Mr. Speaker, 
Those who do not pay their fair share of taxes are depriving the country and its inhabitants of the economic and social infrastructure and services they need. That is the crux of the problem. We're not overspending. We're just not getting in the taxes, and that is the problem. And I'm sorry if I sound draconian, but we have reached the Rubicon, and action has to be taken. Mr. Speaker, I say without fear of contradiction that that type of behavior is unjust and it is unfair. It is unfair to the population. In fact, we are a society that pays no personal income tax. There is no tax on interest earned on savings or dividends. There is neither inheritance tax nor debt duties. There is no capital gains tax when locals sell property for profit. We do not in this country burden our people with the plethora of taxes imposed in the majority of others. It is only fair that the limited taxes that are in place should be paid for the benefit of the nation in which we all live and which we all enjoy. And I make one final plea. I plead with you to pay your taxes. Mr. Speaker, let me now turn to the development of Barbuda. Yes. And what I say now will not be exhaustive. A little later in my presentation, I will speak further about Barbuda. But you will note that we will spend this year at least $135 million to develop Barbuda. And I want a member for Barbuda in particular to listen carefully, to take notes, to listen and learn. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, despite all the hype, and allegations to the contrary. Steady rebuilding continues in Barbuda. The facts are as follows. 250 homes that suffered level one and level two damage during Hurricane Irma were repaired under the China Aid Project. The Barbuda Energy Resilience Project was finalized after in-depth collaboration with the Barbuda Council. This is a US $4.2 million project to be funded through a grant from the United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Fund with counterpart funding provided by the government of Antigua and Barbuda. The components of this project include providing on the ground electricity lines to specific areas within Codrington Village and providing hybrid solar systems to critical buildings including emergency shelters and government buildings. Additionally, the rebuilding of the Hannah Thomas Hospital will be completed by the end of February. And financing arrangements have been put in place to ensure funding for the renovation of the Sir Mac Chesney George Secondary School and to construct the new Holy Trinity Primary School. In terms of private investment, the developers of the PLH Ocean Club made considerable progress with their project. The result has been that in 2019, Many residents in Barbuda have benefited from employment. They have benefited from employment opportunities even at this initial stage of the hotel developmental process. Late in this, this statement, I will detail further projects of Barbuda to be implemented, as I said, at a cost of $135 million. Yes. Easy dollars. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to financial sector stability. Unfortunately, here in Antigua and Barbuda, when we came to power in June of 2014, we had the unfortunate situation in which we inherited economic failure, fiscal failure, and financial failure. No other country in the history of the Caribbean would have had all three failures at the same time. Many of you have taken the performance of my government for granted, but the reality is we did not buckle. As I said before, we have placed our nose to the grindstone. Mr. Speaker, securing a strong banking sector has preoccupied our government over the last five years. In fact, we had one of the weakest banking sectors in the OECS, and that is why we had three bank failures within a period of about nine years. I can say today, that we have one of the strongest banking sectors in OECS. Now, 
I want you to understand that without a strong and viable banking sector, our economy would collapse and our people in every sector would suffer. A strong banking sector is quintessential for development. And that is why early in our government's administration, we acted to save depositors from the failure of the ABI Bank and to bail out the Caribbean Union Bank. When the IMF and others said to us, to allow depositors to lose their money, we say no way. Taxpayers will take the liability. The Caribbean Union Bank is now expected to turn a profit of approximately $4 million in 2019. When others said it was a bad investment, we said to the people of Antigua and Barbuda that we will make it into a good investment. And you can do the math. In a 10-year period, even though there's no increase, you're talking about $40 million in profits. We've invested $30 million, so very shortly we'll start to see real returns. That is the type of vision and proactive leadership that you've gotten from my government. In fact, CUB never made a profit in 10 years with the best business people in this country running it, but with the direction and control of my government. CUB is now making up to $4 million profit. I say to you, our people have significant competence. And I say to you that this government is one of the most competent governments in the entire Caribbean. And it is not a boast. The stats are there for all to see. It will be recalled that we introduced the Deposit Protection Trust to safeguard eligible ABI bank depositors. Some others who are trying to back in the trucks, including some banks in the region, but we're not paying them. Understand they're going to court, we're not paying them. The undertaking that we gave was to cover depositors, not to pay banks within the region who carelessly put their money in ABI bank and lost their money. And we're moving right along. At the end of 2019, our government made all the scheduled bond payments to the Deposit Protection Trust, totaling $72.9 million. Now, just imagine if we didn't have that payment to make. The $73 million could have been placed in roads. As I said to you, we have had so many problems to resolve that it has retarded progress in other areas, and that is why we continue to ask for patience. And the irony about it, those who created all of the problems, they're the ones who are making the most noise. But you know what? We are not spending all this money in education to allow political wannabes to fool our people. And I know that when they make their outlandish claims, that you are silently laughing after them. Mr. Speaker, the former ABI Bank Limited Depositors who signed up to receive the trust benefit have received so far $66.2 million. And that is the kind of caring government we are. And that is the kind of responsible government we are. In fact, we have cleaned up the mess that others so scandalously and recklessly created and failed to resolve. Let us not forget that they had three and a half years to resolve the ABI bank problem. And they did nothing. But all of a sudden, they had all the plans to resolve the problem. Mr. Speaker, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank has rightfully stressed that our banking sector would be more robust and resilient with fewer but stronger banks. And I said to you, as the consolidation takes place, there is no need for fear. At the end of the day, we will have a stronger and more resilient banking sector. Indeed, the threat of losing corresponding banking relations, which confronts our country and other developing states, is due primarily to the small size of our indigenous banks. The truth is, we should have had control of our banking sector and our banking assets decades ago. But you had the foreign banks controlling most of our banking assets, and they left our indigenous banks with the minority of the assets and the poorer class of assets. 
Now, that is why when the Canadian banks sought to exit the Caribbean, including Antigua and Barbuda, our government had to take proactive and strategic action to solidify and strengthen our indigenous banking sector. In fact, we recognize intrinsically that we had to regain control of our assets because banking assets are primarily owned by Antiguans and Barbudans, not necessarily by the banks. Generally speaking, these banks only have about 10% capital. So 90% of these funds that are in deposits, which these banks on lend, they belong to the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. It's our money. Money doesn't belong to Scotiabank and CIBC. It's our money. And we must have a say how those funds are dispensed with or disposed of. And that is the reason why the sudden announcement by the Bank of Nova Scotia to sell its holding in Antigua to Republic Financial Holdings was resisted. We had to in the public interest. Apart from the fact that the transaction disregarded the interests of depositors and workers and sought to bypass the government, the ensuing financial landscape would not have consolidated our local banking sector or strengthened our indigenous institutions. And you know what have happened? What would have happened? they would have become weaker and subject to failure or acquisition. And if they were acquired by other external banks, then the $100 million that they generate in profits will go abroad. That is what we want for the people of Antigua and Barbuda? I say definitely not, Mr. Speaker. As this Honorable House is now aware, our determined intervention and principal arguments have been effective in persuading the Bank of Nova Scotia to, div to divest its antique operations to a local bank. And I can tell you that I met with the Vice President of Scotia Bank and another senior official, and there was nothing but apologies for principal position. In fact, we are optimistic that a mutually acceptable outcome is imminent and will lead to the enhancement of our financial sector for the benefit of the nation. Further, it was a positive and welcomed development late last year that the Antigua Commercial Bank, together with other indigenous banks in the region, acquired the holdings of the Royal Caribbean Bank of Canada or the Royal Bank of Canada in the Eastern Caribbean. And let there be no doubt of the fact that it was our government's firm stand with the Bank of Nova Scotia that led to Royal Bank's decision to sell to local entities. In this regard, our principled position benefited not only our people, but also the people of all the Caribbean countries where Royal Bank had local banks. Now, Mr. Speaker, what is important is this. With the acquisition of the Scotia Bank and Royal Bank branches by indigenous banks, the people of Antigua and Barbuda can be assured that their assets and the profits generated therefrom will be managed, retained, and reinvested for the greater benefit of the domestic economy. So if, for example, that we are able to retain, let's say, $100 million annually in banking profits say that ordinarily would go abroad, then it means that these banks will get stronger so that when the next financial crisis comes, then they'll be able to withstand the crisis without any problem. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to reassure the people of Antigua and Barbuda that notwithstanding how controversial an issue may be, we always act without malice and we always act in the best interests of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. I now turn to blockchain and cryptocurrencies because clearly, you know, we have to find opportunities to diversify 
our country's economy. We are over-reliant on tourism. And we are using our intellect, our entrepreneurial drive, our innovation, and our creativity in order to create opportunities. So blockchain and financial technology, including cryptocurrencies, are new technologies and innovations that have started to compete with traditional methods in the delivery of financial services. And our government not only does not want Antigua and Barbuda left behind in this financial services revolution, but our nation must be among those making or taking early advantage of its benefits and to do so in a well-regulated environment. To that end, draft legislation has already been prepared and will soon be passed in Parliament. Therefore, we look forward to advancing this work in collaboration with entrepreneur Ambassador Calvinier, whose recently opened Canada Place has already begun to position itself as a leader in this global space. We will also enact Real Estate Investment Trust REIT legislation in 2020. And this is a great financing instrument for entrepreneurs. In fact, it may be used by business owners in St. John's to raise financing to renovate their properties. And we certainly will encourage investors, especially those who have large tracts of land, to utilize this mechanism to raise funds for investment. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, let me now speak to the improvement in the credit performance of the banks. Because in the past few years, we have had a problem with many of the banks in which they were looking inwards, they were not lending, and as a result, there was a decline in credit. Now, despite the challenges of de-risking, and costly implement implementation of new regulatory measures. Our banks continue to facilitate economic expansion and development by providing funds to the productive sectors of the economy, and of that we are extremely pleased. The banking sector grew by 2.5% in 2019, following a more than 6% expansion in 2018. Growth in the sector is supported by a 9.8% or 245 million increase in total loans and advances for the period January to September 2019 compared to the same period in 2018. So 245 million in the first nine months of last year. The banks are lending. And they are lending for business development for home construction and even for commercial property construction. $245 million. This boost in credit is due mainly to increased lending for land development and construction from 82.7 million in September 2018 to 177.4 million in September 2019, an increase of 114%. In other words, Mr. Speaker, more people are borrowing for construction, to build homes, and commercial properties. As I said to you, the figures speak for themselves. So they can make all the claim that nothing is happening. Because when Antigans and Barbudans would have borrowed $245 million from the banks to build homes and commercial properties, what did they do? They put the money in a crab hole? The monies were invested in the economy. Mr. Speaker, the loan to deposit ratio increased from 63% in September 2018 to 70% in September 2019. And this augurs well for the profitability of the banks and for increased corporate taxes. We like when they make more profits because we get more money, more tax revenue. Importantly, Mr. Speaker, it is indicative of increased confidence by households and the private sector to make long-term economic decisions for borrowing and investment. And we thank the people of Antigua and Barbuda for the confidence that they have placed in our government. They're buying more cars, building more homes, opening more businesses. 
Even though we have a problem with indiscriminate vending, even vending would have um, increased and we have an appreciation for the fact that people are seeking to help themselves. And that is a confidence that they have in our government. And they can be assured that the business environment will remain buoyant so they can continue to risk their capital and to invest in business in order to create wealth, not only for themselves, but for future generations. That is what we want to the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Mr. Speaker, all of this has become possible because of the growth and development policies of my government that are the heart and soul of our government's work. We are doing this for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And I say to you that progress is real. Progress is measurable. Progress is evident. Again, the figures speak for themselves. Mr. Speaker, I would like to now turn to the bilateral cooperation between Antigua Barbuda and its international partners. At this juncture, I express on behalf of the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda our gratitude to those countries that have contributed through loans, grants, and technical assistance to our economic and social advancement. Among these countries are the People's Republic of China, Cuba, Japan, the Russian Federation, Venezuela, Canada, the United Kingdom, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, the Republic of Korea, India, New Zealand, and our great partner, the United States. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am on a bound to thank especially the People's Republic of China. And I do so because of its responsiveness to our developmental needs and the extent of its contribution to almost all sectors of our economy and social development. The hundreds of millions of dollars provided by China in grants, technical assistance, and concession loans have supported infrastructure, education, energy, national security, housing, sports, and community development projects. Is this the action of a country that is seeking to colonize us? Clearly not. The significance of the support provided by the government and people of China cannot be overstated. Antigua and Barbuda is grateful for the mutual respect and invaluable economic assistance that underpins its friendship with the People's Republic of China, and they can continue to count on the reliability of our country's support. We are a grateful people, and we will never be ungrateful to those who assist us during our time of need. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, foreign relations, let me speak to that, because I think that there may be some misunderstanding in terms of our foreign policy. And I want to address this issue in the context of what Severe would have said on our country's attainment of independence in 1981. On the day that we became a sovereign nation, he said this, and he said it to a joint session of both houses of parliament. Our late revered leader said, and I quote, we extend the hand of friendship to all. But the hand of friendship should not be misinterpreted as an invitation to dictate our policies. We are determined to marry principle with practicality. We will try to fashion an approach that will, at the very least, advance our own development while contributing to global peace and well-being." 
end of quote. Words of wisdom. Mr. Speaker, our government maintains those policies, principles, and precepts. In the wider international community, we in Antigua and Barbuda continue to extend the hand of friendship to all. We are friends of all. We have said time and time again we are too small to have enemies. We may have differences, but those differences are not sustaining. We remain friends of all. But we will not allow anyone to dictate who our friends should be. The enemies of our friends are not our enemies. We are friends of all. Again, I repeat, we are too small to have enemies. And we make no demands on others, nor do we disrespect them in any way. By the same token, we do not accept that we should be disrespected or that unreasonable demands should be made of us. We remain ready to work with all in a spirit of genuine cooperation, mutual respect, understanding, and tolerance within the framework of international law and the principles laid down in the United Nations Charter to which all nations are bound. That is the basis on which as a small state, we preserve, protect, and promote our sovereignty and our rights. We may be small, but we have our pride and we have our sovereign rights to protect. Mr. Speaker, I now speak to 2020 growth and development. And as I said before, growth and development for the benefit of all an all-inclusive government building an all-inclusive and egalitarian society. Mr. Speaker, I turn now to the year ahead of us about which this budget presentation is concerned. The United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean forecasts that our economy will grow yet again. This year, they have projected a growth rate of 6.5%. However, we anticipate outdoing that forecast by delivering larger growth of 7.5% on investments, based on investments programmed for this year. So we are not just picking a figure out of the hat, and we will share with you the various investments. So based on investments that are programmed for this year, we strongly believe that our economy will expand by 7.5%. Now, this economic performance will again be primarily underpinned by tourism, significant construction activity, and major investments in infrastructure. These will produce even more jobs, additional income for families, and overall improvement in the standard of living of our people. And I want you to understand that all we do is to improve the living standards of our people. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, Investments in the tourism sector will top $2 billion. Not million, you know, $2 billion. These tourism investments include the following. One, the $325 million to be spent in 2020 on the PLH Ocean Club on Barbuda. Two, the 125 million renovation expansion project at the existing Rex Halcyon Hotel by Sunwing. Three, the development of a 270 million beach club at Fort James by Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Four, the 540 million one and only hotel and luxury villas at Perns Point. Five, 100 million Amman Hotel project in Barbuda. Six, the 540 million Port Oasis project at Side Hill. Interestingly, this project will be undertaken by the Hadid group of companies in conjunction with international partners. And once completed, this has the potential to receive calls from Virgin Voyages and other vessels. And seven, 
Namco will assume 65% ownership of the Jolly Beach Hotel and will spend $150 million to expand and refurbish the property. And this will make it one of the largest and most beautiful hotels in the OECA subregion. So they can call it Yamco all they want. Namco is about development. In essence, it is our sovereign fund. We operate on the basis, no matter how small our revenue, you have to put aside a few dollars for investment yes. and encourage all our people, even if it's $1,000 a month that you make, save even a $50 every month because savings fuel investments. And if you don't have savings, you can't invest. Now, Mr. Speaker, in addition to these projects, Work will continue or commence on several other properties, including a Best Western Hotel that is under construction, a Marriott Courtyard Hotel at the airport, which was recently approved by DCA, the Calvin Air Wellness Center and Spa at Valley Church, replay Half Moon Bay project, unless it is, continue, it is, it, it, it is um, frustrated by the litigation, and certainly the Yida projects. Now, many private luxury dwellings will also be constructed across Antigua and Barbuda. At Perns Point, Jumbi Bay, Mill Reef Club, Galley Bay Heights, Windward Beach, and the US $50 million property, which is being constructed by Baron Thyssen at Laurie Bay. This project is under construction. In fact, in Barbuda, there is a property that has been constructed at a cost of 35 million US belonging to Jean-Paul de Jury. These are not promised projects. These are projects that are live, that are taking place. Also, the new owners of Kalalu Key will proceed with the hotel project at Morris Bay starting construction later this year. Another exciting hotel project beginning the second quarter of this year is the Bungalows Project at Devil's Bridge. This will be a US 100 million elite island resorts project that offers a wonderful opportunity for Antiguans and Barbudans to acquire a stake in the hotel property. The developer has confirmed that there are two large international tour operators who will market and promote the property. My government has insisted, because we sold them the land, and as a con condition of the sale of the land, my government has insisted or demanded that one third of the development should be made available to Antiguans and Barbudans. Again, as I said, it's a requirement of our government. The developer will provide financing and he will manage the units on behalf of the homeowners. In fact, I'm told that Republic Holdings will be providing most of the financing. So Republic Holdings, they're not our enemies. Now, this is a great opportunity for Antiguans and Barbudans wishing to invest in a tourism property that will yield dividends for generations. In addition, the Sun Ring renovation expansion of the Halcyon Cove Hotel will also offer a similar opportunity for our people to invest in tourism accommodation. We have asked them to make land available within the hotel development to Antiguans and Barbudans to build accommodation properties. We want you to be part of the ownership of the lucrative hotel sector, and we're demanding it. Yet another attractive opportunity for Antiguans and Barbudans is to invest and to have capital in the tourism sector by investing in the Cedar Valley Golf Course. And when I say in the Cedar Valley Golf Course, in a hotel that will be constructed within the Cedar Valley Golf Course. The Cedar Valley Golf Course was voted among the best in the Caribbean and is ripe for development. And that is why my government will make 10 acres of land available to locals. This land is right within the golf course. 
and will make the land available at $3 per square foot for the development of a 50-room Marriott Courtyard-style hotel within the golf course. Individuals or a consortium of local investors are invited to make proposals to the Cabinet for consideration. These investments, costing in excess of $2 billion, will generate an economic boom, creating more jobs, enlarging demand for goods and services, which retailers and wholesalers and owners of every type of business will benefit. Again, we are building an egalitarian and certainly an all-inclusive society. Mr. Speaker, we have had a very contentious issue within the last few months on the issue of global ports, and I would like to speak briefly about it. Contrary to the uninformed comments of certain political opportunists, the government's partnership with Global Ports Holding Limited, GPH, is already proving to be beneficial to our nation. This is a public-private sector partnership for profits, not a giveaway, one in which the people of Antigua and Barbuda, through the government, retained ownership of the cruise port, while GPH will invest $57 million in facilities. I want you to understand. By the way, I have here the land register for all of the land, and all of them registered in Crown or St. John's Development um, Corporation. The land belongs to the government of Antigua and Barbuda. We didn't give anything to anybody. We leased them the property. So I want to file these in this honorable house so the records will reflect that my government never sold any land or any port to rural ports. So, Mr. Speaker, they will be investing 57 million US to complete a fifth pier, allowing us to host the world's largest cruise ships. And they will develop and construct over 50,000 square feet of new retail food and beverage, as well as entertainment facilities to be leased to local persons and they will renovate and enhance the Heritage Key Shopping Complex, $57 million. Now, Mr. Speaker, to be clear, the new pair and new commercial complex will be built by GPH, but owned by the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. I just said to you, we have the deeds. We have here the land registers confirming that the ownership remains in the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. Now, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have, in essence, transferred the loss-making risk in the cruise tourism sector to GPH, and their success will be our successes. After 30 years in this sector, the government has had to subsidize the sector. There are many times in which St. John's Development Corporation and Antigua Pay Group could not have paid the $22 million bond and the government had to take funds from the consolidated fund to pay. We say that's not a good way to do business. So we have decided to rent. And every year, they have to give us a few million US dollars first to put in the treasury. You tell me where's the robbery? Where is the giveaway? I have said to you that we are spending tens of millions to educate you so that people cannot run circles around you, cannot rent space in your heads. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as part of the partnership arrangement, GPH has already paid 21 million US dollars to retire the debt incurred by the government two decades ago to build a Nevis Street Pier. And can you imagine? So we borrowed $22 million to construct the Nevis Street Pier two decades ago. We assigned all of the revenue, all the head tax that we got from the cruise ships to pay the debt. And after 20 years, the principal remained at $21 million. So we said to Global Ports, you know what? 
You take over that debt, pay for that. Put in $57 million to build additional facilities. And by the way, you know, is there money that building the pier down a point wharf? But after 30 years, they have to give it to the government people and to get Barbuda. So where's the robbery? We're not giving them that pay, you know. They're building it with their money. Now, the truth is, we try to do it ourselves. And the cruise operator said to us, on your bike, you're not getting one cent. And we said to them, uh-huh, so you're playing the game. And we said to them, you're not going to exploit us. And we went for global ports and worked with global ports so that they could increase their head tax and so that we could get our new pair. We had to fight for it. And you should be happy about the progress that we've made because the reason why St. Kitts Nevis would have surpassed us and now have in excess of a million tourists is because they can accommodate the largest ships in the world. We do not have any facilities to accommodate the largest ships in the world. They're called the Oasis class ships. And if we do not get a pair that could accommodate them, then clearly we cannot compete. So what are we supposed to do as a government? Sit back and allow St. Kitts to toast us? So you know what? We are partnering with GPH to toast St. Kitts. And I'm not saying this in any derogatory way, just in the spirit of competition. Now, Mr. Speaker, this partnership with GPH will ensure that Antigua and Barbuda acquires the infrastructure to compete in the new cruise tourism space. Further, GPH has already employed 22 Antiguans and Barbudans who are working with taxi drivers, vendors, retailers, rent restauranters, and tour operators to develop and support the local economy. In addition, the company has also contracted the services of several local companies to provide services at Heritage Key and the port. Furthermore, GPH is establishing the YES Foundation, which will contribute five million US dollars, a grant to qualifying Antiguans and Barbudans who have the ambition to start their own business or develop current tourism-focused business. Again, I ask you, where is the giveaway? Here's a situation in which we are pursuing a sustainable partnership with GPH. And the reality is, if they don't increase the tourism traffic within the next two to three years, by at least 1.5 times, they will lose their shirt. They will lose $80 million investment. And then they will have to give us back the port. Now, if they are successful, then the taxi drivers, bingo. The shop owners, the two operators, the government too. The country. So this is a win-win partnership. Now, Mr. Speaker, I would like to turn to public sector projects. Our government will also make significant investments in infrastructural development this year. It's very important. Yes, we have financial challenges, but we also have to ensure that we have adequate infrastructure to support socioeconomic development. Work on the US 90 million St. John's Port redevelopment will be advanced. And it's not a promise. This is a project that is taking place. It has already provided jobs to Antiguans and Barbudans and benefited countless operators, businesses to include heavy equipment operators. Now, when it is completed, our country will have one of the most modern seaports in the Caribbean, supplying transshipment facilities to other countries, earning new revenues, and providing a wide range of jobs and businesses opportunities for locals. Now, with a modern airport and seaport, both hubs for the movement of people and goods regionally and internationally, it should clearly be seen that our country will assume strategic importance for trade and tourism within the OECS subregion. And that is where we want to be, a hub of enterprise and innovation, an outward-looking free trading nation a country that is fit for the future. Mr. Speaker, crucial to realizing a vibrant, busy nation is the development of our network of roads. And I, we know that this is an issue for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. We have 400 miles of road to fix because 
All of the roads were left in a decrepit condition. All. And by the way, you know, they spent $1.5 billion and there's nothing to show. $1.5 billion in roads. And those same people have a lot to say. Anyway, despite the challenges, work on the Frizil Road and Sir George Walter Highway progressed in 2019, although protracted. And I want to thank you very much for your patience. We understand the frustration, but the reality is we're making progress. To date, nearly $40 million have been spent on these highways. Mr. Speaker, our government has awarded a further $63 million a contract for a second phase of rehabilitation of our road network, our roads network. There will be a major upgrade to Anchorage Road, Old Palm Road, Sir Sydney Walling Highway, and Valley Road North. And I'm sure you'd have seen the surveyors on the road. They're presently doing the design work. And as soon as the design is completed, construction will start. Now, Although it is seldom acknowledged by critics, work was also carried out on several secondary roads in communities across the country where concrete roads have been constructed. But you know, when you have 400 miles of road to build, I can, I can understand that there's still a lot of frustration. But with time, we will resolve the road problems in the country. Now, Mr. Speaker, rehabilitation of these secondary roads will be advanced this year. We will make additional resources available in order to expedite the repairs to these secondary roads. I now wish to look at the investment in sport complexes. Mr. Speaker, we know that we have the raw material among our young people to produce Olympic champions. What has been missing are the facilities to train and develop the existing talent. I am pleased to report that by the end of February, we will complete a facility at Yasco where an athletic track of international standard will be ready. That's right. Again, we thank you for your patience, but we're there. We're capable of being as internationally outstanding in athletics as we are in cricket. A game we must continue to promote in tribute to the greats we have produced and as an inspiration for the greats waiting to assert their place. In this connection, we intend to renovate and refurbish the Antigua Recreation Grounds. It will be used not only as a main venue for Carifesta 15, which we will host in 2021, but as a national monument for the many historic moments in cricket and history which echo from its grounds. Mr. Speaker, let me also speak briefly about the public cemetery. Another important public sector project will be the development of a new cemetery. This will be a modern cemetery located at Tomlinson's and it will address the shortage of space at the public cemetery, which has reached maximum capacity. So that issue will be addressed this year. I now turn to West Indies Oil Company, which has been a most beneficial investment for all the people. So Speaker, Frizel Road is undoubtedly the pathway of a burgeoning commercial center. In fact, it is practically the new business district. This year, the Western East Oil Company WIOC, in partnership with a regional investor, will accelerate the development of a center by investing $40 million into a thriving business park. Over the past four years, WIOC has invested $154 million in expanding its facilities. That's right, $154 million. When it was owned by the previous expatriate, they sweated the assets, made a lot of profits and repatriated the profits. That company was really part of an extractive industry to satisfy the requirements of the foreign investor. We have changed that. And their investments, as I said, is significant. 
And this includes an LPG tank farm that was officially inaugurated in October 2019, quadrupling storage capacity and ensuring that the demand for LPG can be met more effectively. Notice last Christmas, nobody ran out of um, propane gas. It's not a coincidence, it's because of the increase in supply. And when you look at the successes at West Indiesel Company, it speaks to the talent of our people. Our local managers, to include the Chief Executive Officer, Gregory Georges, would have outperformed. <laughs> would have outperformed the expatriate Wall Streeters, the Caucasian, that felt that he had superior skills. Mr. Speaker, these investments have boosted the company's financial performance, which in turn has resulted in payment of increased taxes and dividends to the state. We have determined that our industries must benefit the people, not to extract profits for the benefit of those abroad. Now, between 2015 and 2019, we have paid $39 million in corporation taxes and $26.8 million in dividends, giving a total yield of $65.8 million. I said to you that if ever there was a success story from government intervention and participation in ownership, WIAC is that story. Well, the time has come for us to offer shares in WIAC to citizens of our country so that they too can benefit directly from its financial achievements. And I know that we have promised this before, but we are now in a position to give a firm commitment. The government has made firm arrangements to divest a portion of its 51% stake in the company through a public offering on the Eastern Caribbean Stock Exchange by May of this year. A firm commitment. And I've said to the management, get it done by May of this year. The offering will be structured so that individuals who may not be able to afford to purchase shares by themselves will be able to do so as part of an investment club. We want to encourage people to pool their resources in order to avail themselves of these opportunities. The objective is to move our people beyond being workers and wage earners and into being owners of real property, businesses, and other assets. By the way, many of you waiting for your wealth when you go to heaven. <laughs> I say to you that the best situation is to have wealth on earth and wealth in heaven. Because if you don't develop wealth on earth, you may end up poor in heaven. And I'm not being blasphemous. Mr. Speaker, ownership is empowerment. I want to repeat, ownership is empowerment. If, you're not, if you don't own anything, you're not empowered. Our people must not sit on the sidelines of their country's prosperity. We are determined that they must actively participate in it. Our government is given that opportunity to all even members of the opposition. Because the truth is, if they will stop their idleness and contribute to economic development, our country will be better off. And I'm speaking from experience, because when I was in opposition, I contributed significantly to economic development. And I will extend the same opportunity, myself and my colleagues, to members of the opposition. And staying on a radio station and talking 24-7 can't create no value. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, other opportunities will be given for investment and ownership in State Insurance Co Company Limited, in Namco, and other government corporations. Now, as we develop new and profitable businesses, and as you know, my government is an entrepreneurial government, we take business risk. We develop businesses, but we will make sure that a portion of the shares are available to Antiguans and Barbudans. 
And this is empowerment capitalism at work. And this is not a socialist construct. This is a capitalist construct that is inclusive to make sure that not only a small cadre of people would benefit from the gains of the country, but that every Antiguan and Barbudan will be given equality of opportunity to participate in the gains of this country. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to public utilities. The Antigua Public Utilities Authority continues to position itself to meet the diverse and dynamic challenges ahead. More frequent and severe weather phenomena have amplified the need for more resilient infrastructure. Therefore, the utilities company has embarked on a program to increase, increase its generation capacity by a further 25 to 30 megawatts of power. In order to keep pace with the expected water demand of 8 million gallons per day, and we have to understand that this is a moving target. Two years ago, it was 6 million. Today, it's 8 million. So as a consequence, we have to continue to make interventions. Two new reverse osmosis plants will be installed, one at Fort James and the other in Bethesda. The Fort James reverse osmosis plant will primarily serve Heritage Key and the Central Business District. The Bethesda, plant, the Bethesda reverse osmosis plant will replace the DLAPS water treatment plant during extreme drought conditions when water is below extraction level at the Potworks Dam Reservoir. An aging, leaky distribution network has exacerbated APU's efforts to provide water consistently. And to address this, the authority will undertake a $30 million repiping project to reduce loss and increase supply to homes and businesses. Again, we inherited a decrepit water infrastructure with all kind of rotten, old, galvanized pipes. And by the way, you know, I understand some of them are even old lead pipes. You can tell how long they've been there. And again, the administration that was in power for 10 years, they did nothing. But again, they're making the most nice. Now, in terms of telecommunications, the government will proceed with its US $30 million project to significantly upgrade the telecommunications, telecommunications infrastructure. And by, by the way, that has started. Many of you now have fiber to the home. That is expanding rapidly. So the investment is ongoing. And very shortly, we will actually enhance the rate of participation of our people in the broadband services from APUA PCS. Now, this will include investment in an underwater fiber optic cable to bring more reliable and affordable broadband internet service to the fiber to home initiative. And I know that there are many who are blaming the government for slow internet services. But the reality is, it's cable and wireless and digital who's selling crappy service for an expensive um, fee. That is a fact. And I wanted to hear very clearly. So guess what? We can't rely on them. So we are getting APUA to build out its own infrastructure so you can get good quality affordable service. So we're not having a call with them. They can continue to provide a crappy service. We'll put money in APUA to satisfy the demands of our people. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak a little further about continued investment in education because you know, education is really one of the most significant planks in our developmental strategy. Healthcare and education. We want to make sure that we have people who are the brightest in the world and the healthiest. And we all know that knowledge is power. Therefore, empowering our human resources is as important as investing in physical infrastructure. And that is why this year, our government will inject another $20 million in the UE5 Islands campus. In fact, these funds will include $8.1 million EC dollars contribution from global ports and will be used to help to construct dormitories and administrative block, sporting and recreational facilities, and to create an entrance to the campus that is befitting of an institution of higher learning. We are determined that 
with the shortest possible time, our people will be equipped with the knowledge and certification that allows them to compete with the best in the world. And we know that the pathway to tertiary education is a good secondary education. And we have some school leavers here. <coughs> we want to tell you, make good use of the opportunity for a sound secondary education, because we need you to accelerate growth and development in this country in the future. You are the leaders of this country, today's leaders and tomorrow's leader, our leaders. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I indicated before, we will upgrade the St. Mary's Secondary School, Otters Comprehensive School, and St. Novel Richards Academy. The nearly $9 million project to rehabilitate and expand the Sir George or McChesney George Secondary School in Barbuda has already begun. I don't even think that the member for Barbuda is aware. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support capacity building and ongoing professional development for all teachers in all disciplines, including special needs education. And the government will also offer scholarships for postgraduate studies to Antiguans and Barbudans who aspire to work at the UE5 Islands campus. The highly successful adult learning program has been a resounding success with 1,600 students enrolled, and it will be strengthened in 2020. It will be given its own home. Amen. And I want to commend the member for St. Mary's South and certainly Troy Allen for a great initiative of which the people of Antigua and Barbuda should be extremely proud. Now, Mr. Speaker, I now speak to the transformation of Barbuda in 2020. And again, I call upon the member for Barbuda to take note, because I'm not sure if the member continue to speak out of ignorance or if he is just endowed with a fraudulent tongue. So I now wish to lay out our plans to secure even greater progress in Barbuda. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, I'm not implying any improper motive. I'm just speculating. Working in cooperation with the Barbuda Council, our government intends to implement the following projects. Rehabilitation of the Barbuda Community Center, repair and furnishing of the council administrative building, construction of a new disaster office, construction of a multi-purpose center, which will also serve as a disaster shelter, expansion of the reverse osmosis plant and storage tank, and development of the agricultural infrastructure. Importantly, a master plan for the future development of Barbuda, including crucial environmental studies, will be created in full consultation with the people who live on the island. Further, a project under the auspices of the Prince's Foundation and funded by Ambassador Calvinier, will construct up to 20 new homes on five acres of land at Louis Hill, and the beneficiaries will be Barbudans whose homes are completely demolished during Hurricane Irma. A project funded with a $15.5 million grant from the European Union will start this month to rebuild 150 homes that suffered major damage during the passage of Hurricane Irma. Preliminary land clearing, geotechnical soil investigations, and building layout works have already been completed in preparation for the pending construction work at the 15-acre lot earmarked for the new Holy Trinity School. This project is jointly funded by the government of Antigua and Barbuda and the Dominican Republic and will feature 16 classroom spaces, administrative offices, a cafeteria, a security booth, secure parking, and recreational space for basketball, tennis, soccer, and cricket. There will also be a $20 million renewable energy project, which will be funded primarily by a grant from the United Arab Emirates. This will supply one megawatt of energy which, be, which will be sufficient to power all of Barbuda during the daytime hours. 
Battery power will be added systematically in the future, which will make Antigua and Barbuda, or Barbuda for that matter, an island totally powered by solar voltaic energy. We're making Barbuda totally green. Mr. Speaker, the development and transformation of Barbuda requires access to it, particularly for its tourism industry. To facilitate such access, the government will invest additional funds which will bring the total investment to $55 million to complete the new airport on Barbuda this year within the first half of this year. Now, the estimated value of all the projects which either will be completed or advanced on Barbuda in 2020 is $155 million, not including the private sector developments. In fact, I say this without any fear of contradiction, that no other administration would have contributed more in one year, in fact, not even a decade, to the development of the Barbuda and its people. And when the member for Barbuda speaks, I challenge him to tell the people of Antigua and Barbuda which administration, even during a 10-year period, would have spent as much as $155 million to develop Barbuda. I say to him, there's none. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Barbudans can expect a significant boost in economic activity, new job opportunities, and increased incomes. We want Barbudans to be independent people. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the issue of housing. As this Honorable House knows very well, providing affordable housing, especially low-income social housing for the poor and vulnerable, is one of the most important goals of our government. Grant funding of $120 million from the People's Republic of China, China will pay for the construction of 250 low-income, climate-resilient homes at several locations in Antigua, with approximately 50% earmarked for the Bubi Ali area. 50 of the homes will also be constructed on Barbuda. The National Housing and Urban Renewal, which built and handed over 87 homes in 2019 at Painters Development, will complete construction of another 73 this year at that location. At Denfields, 60 homes have been completed and are waiting distribution upon the completion of the infrastructure. And I'll say this, that the infrastructure will be in place within a matter of weeks. Under the Build on Your Own Land option, National Housing also completed and transferred 63 homes to homeowners and 100 parcels, parcels of land were sold to Antiguan and Barbudan citizens in the Friesville development. 94 parcels of land at Donovan's are currently being distributed under the Land for Youth initiative, and 92 parcels at Royal Gardens are being distributed to potential homeowners. The Central Housing and Planning Authority has developed approximately 20 new homes at North Sound this year, or last year, with a further 10 on the construction at Lightfoot. And between Chapel and the Lands Division, approximately 250 parcels of land were sold in 2019. In fact, as part of the government's strategy to renew and expand the housing stock rapidly, Lands are being sold at a concessional rate of $3 per square foot to contractors and developers who will build affordable homes for sale to citizens and residents. This type of development will take place at Belmont, Painters, Judges Hill, Lightfoot, and Bolands. To help accelerate the supply of homes to Antiguans and Barbudans, the China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation CCECC 
We'll also construct a few hundred homes in Painters, Bolands, and Belmont. Now, let me make it abundantly clear that for these properties, lands will only be transferred from the Crown to the homeowner. At no point during the process will CCECC hold title to the lands. So we're not selling the Chinese any land. This project will be executed under the oversight of Chapel. Chapel will also be constructing additional low-income homes for individuals who do not qualify under the National Housing Initiative. The United Nations Office of Project Services, NUNOPS, and Bo Panel have recently acquired funding to construct a factory in Antigua to manufacture 10,000 affordable sustainable homes. And if we have to give credit to the former administration, we thank them for the contact. <laughs> now, 2,500 of these homes will be allocated to Antiguans and Barbudans, while the others will be exported to countries in the Eastern Caribbean. The price of these homes will be under 150,000 EC dollars. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, Unlike the previous partnership which, uh, in which Bureau Panel would have utilized domestic financing and speculated with hundreds of acres of domestic land, this is a credible partnership with UNOPS, which my government fully endorses. It will bring foreign direct investment that will create jobs and develop an export product. In fact, we never stopped the Bureau Panel project. What we did, we took back about 200, 200 acres of land which they were given to speculate with. But we left them with over 40 acres to pursue the development. And as you know, they have been constructing homes during the last year and a half. Mr. Speaker, our country is experiencing a housing revolution that will benefit all Antiguans and Barbudans. And I give a commitment that public servants, particularly teachers, nurses, police, and soldiers, will receive special access to these housing projects. We are determined to build a prosperous and inclusive economy where everyone can shine, wherever in Antigua and Barbuda they live, and whatever their socioeconomic circumstances. Let me now speak to the issue of the business environment and our efforts to improve the business environment. Our government recognizes the importance of a vibrant and expanded business community to strengthen our economy, to create full employment and enlarge tax revenues needed by the state to provide for the well-being of our society. And that's why last April, a business forum was convened as the first in a series of interactions between the government and the business community. Over 200 business people attended, representing a diverse range of sectors. The objectives of the forum were to encourage business creation and expansion for policymakers to hear directly from business owners about their experiences, and more importantly, to elicit recommendations for improving the business environment. A business forum working group has been reviewing the recommendations, and developing a work plan with input from the relevant agencies for the implementation of the recommendations. The work plan and report of the working group will be delivered at the next business forum to be held in April of 2020. However, in anticipation of the report, our government has already begun to take action to improve the business environment, making it easier to do business. Interventions include reviewing and simplifying the tax code, publishing relevant taxpayer information, and introducing systems for the automation of tax collection at Inland Revenue and Customs. Also, a maritime single window system will be soon operational to help to improve trade facilitation, and an automated economic operators program will be implemented shortly. These arrangements will allow pre-approved businesses and importers to expedite clearance of their goods. 
Let me now speak to the Antigua and Barbuda Development Bank, which was literally bankrupted as a result of the corrupt acts of a previous administration. Mr. Speaker, we are also actively exploring options to recapitalize the ailing Antigua and Barbuda Development Bank, the ABDB, so that it can play the vital role for which it was originally conceived. The government will work with the CARICOM Development Fund, the CDF, to undertake a comprehensive assessment of the ABDB. At the end of this process will be a revitalized and well-capitalized ABDB with a streamlined mandate, improved operations, and a relevant suite of products to meet the needs of small businesses. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the issue of renovating and reinvigorating St. John's. In fact, an important matter related to improving the business environment is the decrepit state of the St. John's city. None of us can be content with its present condition. It urgently needs major refurbishing and rebranding. And that is not a job for the government alone. It requires the participation of all stakeholders, especially those who own properties in St. John's and those who conduct business there. We collectively need to determine what St. John's should represent to locals and what face it should show to the many visitors to our shores. And this connection, our government will convene a meeting of representatives of property owners and other stakeholders in the nation's capital, to include vendors, to explore options for a public-private partnership with the sole purpose of refurbishing, renovating, and revamping St. John's City. Crucial to that meeting will be a sewage system and treatment facility. The installation of a modern system is long overdue, not only for health reasons, but also for the aesthetics of the capital city and the protection and preservation of our marine resources surrounding St. John's. Our government has started negotiations with potential funding agencies. However, the participation of property owners and all those who conduct and benefit from business in the capital should contribute to the ultimate solution. Mr. Speaker, an important factor in tackling issues that adversely affect St. John's is traffic congestion caused in part by a lack of adequate parking for motor vehicles. In this connection, the National Assets Management Company Limited, Namco, has engaged a team to begin work at the unfinished car park that stands as an eyesore in the city. The project involves securing and cleaning the site in the coming weeks, while an extensive engineering and structural assessment of the building is conducted to inform its final construction. The intention is to make the car park operational before the end of the year, while we identify a private sector company or consortium to partner with us to finish the building so that the rest of it could be utilized profitably. Mr. Speaker, I would like to now speak to manufacturing and agriculture. If we were to fairly assess the potential of manufacturing and agriculture in Antigua and Barbuda, our country's physical, natural resource and human resource endowment do not really allow for these sectors to lead in our economy in terms of income and foreign exchange generation. That is a reality that we've had to contend with. In 2019, agriculture contributed 0.7% or $23.4 million of gross domestic product, and manufacturing contributed 1.9% or $61 million. However, despite their small size, they are still very important sectors. They provide opportunities for small businesses to develop, uh, to advance our food security, to reduce the amount of foreign exchange spent on imported goods, and to cre create employment for our people. Our government will therefore continue to provide concessions to the operators in these sectors to encourage growth and to enhance their contribution to GDP. Mr. Speaker, in terms of manufacturing, 
a few exciting projects will be implemented in 2020. One is the US 20 million Caribbean plant, and the other is the US 10 million Harris Paints factory. And I believe we have a representative here from Caribbean to signal the commitment to the construction of this factory within the next 10 to 11 months. The Harris Paints Company has already made a sizable investment and proposes to start operations shortly. The Caribbean plant is set to start construction in April. Also, Parley will commence construction of their waste recycling base later this year. As far as we're concerned, waste is a resource. And we will make sure that we recycle waste to turn them into items of good value added. These ventures will create manufacturing jobs and increase the level of manufacturing exports. Manufacturing will be further boosted by the opening of the factory to manufacture prefabricated homes under the UNOPS bow panel project that I mentioned earlier. Mr. Speaker, our interventions in agriculture this year will strengthen food and security and nutrition, encourage greater participation in the sector and help to alleviate poverty among the vulnerable groups in society. We also will reinvigorate the Backyard Gardening Initiative and embark on a program to encourage small plot farming on designated crown lands. Mr. Speaker, the government will retain the regime for concessions and equipment and inputs for use in agriculture and will continue to pursue partnerships with bilateral partners like China, Cuba, Suriname, multilateral agencies such as the FAO to provide technical support to farmers and technicians in the sector. Finally, to encourage participation in the agricultural sector, all loans from the Entrepreneurial Development Fund to farming will be provided at 1%. And where agricultural businesses create jobs or begin to export their products to create foreign exchange earnings, loans will be converted to interest-free loans. We're doing all we can to doing all we can to improve the contribution of agriculture to GDP as a very important sector for our food security and our food sovereignty. Now, Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the issue of medical cannabis. Mr. Speaker, the Medical Cannabis Authority Board was established in March of 2019 as a first step towards the creation of a progressive framework to regulate and promote the use of cannabis for medicinal purposes. The government will now focus on encouraging entry into the midstream market of the industry, which involves manufacturing of products such as creams, tinctures, aromatherapy oils, and confectionery made from cannabis. And obviously, these will be well regulated with very low levels of THC. Interest remains high among potential investors, and the Medical Cannabis Authority Board has registered interest from several companies. One such prospect is the possible acquisition by former world heavyweight champion Mike Tyson of a hotel property that would be converted into a wellness center for treatment of diseases using hemp and other natural products. In this regard, our government will make amendments to the laws regulating the cultivation and, and use of hemp and its byproducts in Antigua and Barbuda. Finally, a major conference will be held in Antigua later this year to bring together investors, industry professionals, scientists, and other stakeholders to advance the development of this industry. Now, Mr. Speaker, in order to grow a country sustainably, we must do so in a safe environment. So I now turn to the issue of national safety. Antigua and Barbuda is a nation where its people are blessed to live in, a, in relative peace and tranquility. 
There are countries where people are forced to exist under chaotic and turbulent circumstances and suffer unspeakable tragedy and loss. The government is keenly aware that the 75% reduction in the number of murders, the 42% decline in serious crimes, and general maintenance of law and order in 2019 can be fragile and fleeting. Consistent efforts is necessary for national security and public safety. We will not relent. A commitment and diligence of the men and women who serve in our various law enforcement agencies cannot be overstated. I commend the Royal Antigua and Barbuda Police Force for the work done over the past year to contain the level of homicides and serious crimes, especially gun-related offenses. I also thank our people as well for their forbearance and to manage their conflicts rather than resorting to these heinous crimes. The Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force and the ONDCP also played very important roles in combating criminal elements in our society, and I also commend their work. Our government will invest more in crime-fighting equipment, promote capacity building, and secure more specialist training in 2020 to maintain the safety and security of all the people within our shores, and certainly those who choose to spend their vacations with us. Mr. Speaker, the other major area of our developmental strategy is health care. And I would like to focus especially on tackling non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases. We have made a lot of progress in terms of improving tertiary health care. But the focus going forward will be a preventative focus focusing primarily on reducing non-communicable diseases which pose a serious threat to our society. So there's no doubt that we've made a lot of progress in advancing health care. But non-communicable diseases include, including diabetes, hypertension, cancer, chronic kidney failure, strokes, and autoimmune conditions are having an increasing impact on our population. They represent a serious risk to our people. Now, these diseases create significant strain on the healthcare system, reduce the productive years of many young persons, and wreak havoc on the emotional and financial well being of families. While we have made strides in prolonging the life of our people, for too many, the quality of those additional years is diminished. Our government is responding to this challenge in a multifaceted way. We recognize that the lifestyle choices of our people are major contributors to the rising incidences of non-communicable diseases. Therefore, we will enhance public awareness and public education on the importance of being active and eating a balanced and healthy diet. Our government will also encourage community sporting activities, including events for the young and the elderly. We will also establish outdoor gyms in various communities. The ministries of health, sports and education will collaborate to implement this initiative beginning this year. Finally, we will introduce a tax on sugary beverages to help to reduce consumption and to prompt healthier choices. Mr. Speaker, I would like to now speak to protection of the poor and the vulnerable. In thriving economies across the world, there are persons who are vulnerable and need assistance. In this statement, I have acknowledged that there are pockets of poverty that continue to exist in our country. I have also made it clear that we are tackling it. Our government maintains several small or several social programs that benefit the elderly, orphans, persons with disabilities, and poor or indigent individuals. Hundreds of persons are served by the Board of Guardians, the Home Advancement or Happy Program, in which we literally give free homes to people who have dilapidated homes, and the 
Government Residential and Care for the Elderly, the GRACE program. Also, nearly 9,000 persons receive assistance to the PDV CAB People's Benefit and Utility Subsidy programs. We are pledged to continue these programs because the reality is every life is an important life. Every citizen is important to our society. Our government will not let anyone suffer or anyone go hungry because we care. And you can rest assured that we'll always care. Many of us, even though we now control levers of power, we emanated out of conditions of poverty. So we can empathize with the poor and the vulnerable. And we'll do all we can to protect the poor and the vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, I now move to the issue of youth empowerment. And you can see from the benches, especially within the Senate, the amount of females and youth that my government would have empowered. And I'm sure you can also make a contrast. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this government's primary initiative for the empowerment of our youth is the provision of every opportunity from the primary to tertiary level to acquire knowledge. For those young people who, for whatever reason, did not manage in their school years, their formal years, we provide a second chance program by which they can earn certification to improve their employability and to equip themselves for higher learning. Our government makes acquisition of real property possible through its Land for Youth program. I just announced that we have made 94 parcels available recently. Also, the Young Entrepreneurs component of the Entrepreneurial Development Program is in place and provides special access to resources, mentoring, and technical support in order to execute business ideas. All young people with a business idea and a passion to see it through are encouraged to contact the EDB team located at the Sajiko building on Factory Road and irrespective of your political persuasion. The Science and Innovation Center that is being managed by UNOPS to promote local entrepreneurship offers great prospects for the youth to develop programming skills and identify innovative use of technology to solve real world problems. Further, with the retrofitting of the former Deluxe Cinema, those who are interested in music, in the arts and culture will have a dedicated space to hone their skills. Our nation has witnessed the remarkable achievements of Khan Cardis and our international teen sensation aura in music. And Alzari Joseph, Rakeem Cornwall, and Hayden Walsh Jr. in cricket. Where they have succeeded, others can. Our government offers the opportunities our young people must certainly take advantage of them. Mr. Speaker, I will now like to speak to the public service and public servants. And I know many of them are here today. And whereas we demand the best level of productivity, you can be assured that we are equally committed to make sure that you share equitably in the gains of our country. Since 2018, our government's negotiating team has been talking with the bargaining agents represented the interests of public sector workers. I have to admit that the culture has been to have protracted negotiations. We would have hoped that those negotiations would have been completed by now. And that is why we use the initiative at least 18 months ago to give an interim increase of 5% without, without any prejudice to the outcome. It was not a matter of cheap politics. It was a matter of ensuring that at least there was some benefit while the negotiations take place. Also, back pay owed to public servants and uh, payment for outstanding non-negotiated contract periods from since 2003 up to 2017 have been paid by my government. Now, these two actions were executed at a cost of $70 million. That's right, $70 million. Talks have progressed to the stage 
where the government's negotiating team has received proposal from almost all the bargaining agents and has submitted counter proposals to half of them. And those who have proposals outstanding, we ask you to execute them because uh, by holding those or protracting your responses, you are also holding up others, including the teachers and nurses we're quite sure would like to have their packages completed as soon as possible. But evidently, we're trying to have a holistic negotiation rather than to do it on a piecemeal basis. Now, as can be expected, there are differing views on the quantum and the mechanics of the increase. But the purpose of negotiations is to narrow differences and to find practical common ground. And that is what we are working toward. Meanwhile, our government continues to be mindful of the other issues affecting public servants and has demonstrated its willingness to resolve them. For instance, we have addressed the misalignment between the government's retirement age and the Social Security's pension age. Effective May 1, 2020, the retirement age for public servants will be 65 years, but public servants will have the option for early retirement between the ages of 55 and 60. Further, where the age of a public servant corresponds with the Social Security pension age, the public servant will be able to retire with full benefits. And that is not all. Our government has introduced measures to assist public servants with home repairs and home ownership. But we recognize that while many have benefited from these arrangements, other public servants have not been able to capitalize on them. Therefore, we are implementing new procedures to allow easier access to the following initiatives. One, public servants seeking to build their first home will be eligible for concessions provided under the ABI Construct Antigua Barbuda Initiative, CABI, for a dwelling home valued up to $400,000. The general CABI threshold is $350,000. Two, Public servants will also be able to benefit from a special window at the Caribbean Union Bank for repairing and refurbishing their homes. An approved public servant can get up to $50,000 for home repairs at an attractive interest rate, and the government will guarantee up to $5 million to CUB to facilitate this special arrangement. Public servants, public servants building their first house or repairing their home will be able to get concessions on import duty normally applied to building supplies and home furnishings. Mr. Speaker, the government machinery can never function without the efforts of committed, diligent, and professional public servants. Therefore, the government will do all in its power to ensure public sector employees receive their fair share of the increased economic pie. Let it be noted that our government has shown its appreciation, and we sincerely apologize by any disrespect that may have been shown by any, gov any member of my administration. Mr. Speaker, since 2014, government spending on wages and salaries has increased by more than $100 million, and every public servant and their families have benefited. In fact, when we came to government in June of 2014, we took on several hundred people, even though we were in an economic crisis. That is the extent of my government to ensuring that the people of Antigua and Barbuda could work and eat. And we know that it would have strained the public resources, but we would rather carry the strain than to leave people unemployed, hungry, and idle. And that is, again, the commitment of our people, to our government, to Antiguans and Barbudans. Mr. Speaker, I will now speak to financing climate resilience. The people of the Caribbean, including Antigua and Barbuda, know that climate change is real because we have lived through its devastating effects. Therefore, we must be conscious that all our efforts at renovation and renewal could be in vain if a major hurricane rips through the country. That is why we have to build a more resilient economy and a more resilient country. In this regard, I am pleased to announce that following 
a successful partnership with the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, and the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, a US 15 million renewable energy project was issued a few years ago. And just recently, the fund has approved another US $15 million for phase two of the project. This brings a total investment to 30 million United States dollars. This investment in both wind and solar energy will benefit public buildings primarily. Mr. Speaker, our investment in renewable energy is nearly US $70 million and is evidence of our commitment to reducing our carbon footprint and building resilience and certainly adapting to climate change. While these investments help, they are not sufficient to build the effective shield our country needs to protect itself against the catastrophe of repeated hurricanes. And that is why our government established the Sustainable Island Resource Framework, the SURF, that became operational in 2019. It will program almost 21 million EC dollars from the Green Climate Fund and other donor agencies in 2020. A key activity of the fund will be to facilitate homeowners who need financing to make their homes climate resilient and drought ready through highly concession loans. And when we say drought ready, to construct cisterns or other water catchments. The board of the SURF is finalizing the details of this facility to allow access to funding before the 2020 hurricane season. But Mr. Speaker, we recognize that while this fund is important, it too is insufficient for the task before us. Much more is needed or a major hurricane could sweep away literally in one fell swoop all the advances and progress we have made including all infrastructure built by private investors and the government in the vital tourism sector. Given the devastating effects of cli climate change and the implications for our way of life and very existence, it is critical that we build several facilities to help finance resilience and support our development. Therefore, the government will also establish a climate resilience and development fund the CRDF in 2020. The purpose of this fund is to finance projects and programs that will build climate resilience, provide a buffer for public finances in times of natural disasters, and support development of our country. This fund will be financed mainly through a tourism accommodation levy, a TAL, T -A -L, which will be applicable to hotel accommodation, guest houses, apartments, Airbnb rentals, and villas. This levy will be charged at a rate of US dollars, $3 per guest per night, for room rates up to 150 US per night. For rooms with rates above US 150 per night, the levy will be charged at a rate of US dollars, $5 per guest per night. Mr. Speaker, the tourism accommodation levy will take effect from March 1, 2020. Now, some will argue that this accommodation levy will increase the cost of our tourism. But our government has discussed this levy with key operators in the tourism industry in Antigua and Barbuda who have contributed to refining the levy. They recognize that tourism is vulnerable to the impact of climate change, and therefore, it is in their interest to help to build climate resilience. The other consideration is that if the financing for this vital undertaking does not come from the tourism levy, it would have to come from the pockets of the workforce of our people. We have chosen the levy over increased taxation of the workers of this nation, and that decision we feel sure is the right one at this time. On a related matter, Mr. Speaker, with effect from March 1st, our government will no longer waive the 10% recovery charge, the RRC, that customs and excise is mandated to collect on imported items. A portion of the additional revenue that will be generated from the collection of the full amount of the RRC 
will be transferred to the Climate Resilience and Development Fund. Preliminary estimates indicate that the tourism accommodation levy and the rollback of the RRC concessions could yield between 50 and $80 million annually, or 1 to 2 percent of our GDP. Mr. Speaker, I now move to Budget 2020, the projections for 2020. I turn to the estimates of revenue and expenditure for 2020, which support a set of policies that will continue to deliver growth and development for the benefit of all. The detailed schedules of all revenues and expenditure, including their sources, are provided in the appendix to this statement. Total resource requirements for the 2020 fiscal year amount to $1.7 billion. This represents an increase of 20 percent, or $288 million when compared to total estimates of 2019. Estimated recurrent expenditure, including principal payments, is $1.006 billion, while recurrent revenue is $1.02 billion. Therefore, a small current account surplus of 14 million is projected for 2020. The components of recurrent expenditure are wages and salaries at 430.1 million, transfers and grants at 158.3 million, pensions and gratuities at 87 million, goods and services at 174.9 million, interest payments at 123.2 million, and statutory contributions of $32 million. Mr. Speaker, the components of recurrent revenue are the following. Indirect tax revenue, 664.1 million. Direct tax revenue, 118.2 million. Non-tax revenue, 237.8 million. Government's capital budget for 2020 is 206.1 million, which will be 58.5 percent above the amount budgeted in 2019. Mr. Speaker, recurrent expenditure, excluding principal payments, plus capital expenditure, gives total expenditure of 1.21 billion for fiscal year 2020. Total revenue and grants in fiscal year 2020 is 1.12 billion, a 16 percent or 154 million increase over the amount budgeted in 2019. Therefore, the projected fiscal deficit for fiscal year 2020 will be $96 million. This will be a 45 percent reduction in the overall deficit compared to the estimated deficit for 2019. So you can say that we are going through a process of consolidation whilst expanding the economy. Now, while the government will continue to stimulate the economic or the economy for that matter through strategic project implementation, evidence in the significant capital budget for 2020, we will contain recurrent expenditure. Additionally, fiscal performance will improve due to increased revenue collections. Mr. Speaker, this enhancement in revenues will not be the result of any new tax on the population. I repeat, there will be no new tax on the population. It will be achieved through improved tax administration and implementation of the Tourism Accommodation Levy, the TAL, in March of 2020. The contributors to the $1.02 billion of revenue or recurrent revenue expected in fiscal year 2020 are as follows. Tax revenue, which is projected to be $782.4 million, or about 77 percent of recurrent revenue. Non-tax revenue will make up the remaining 23 percent of recurrent revenue and is estimated at $237.9 million in budget 2020. Mr. Speaker, tax revenue comprises indirect taxes and direct taxes. Direct taxes are expected to yield $118.3 million. The main contributors to direct taxes 
uh, corporate income tax, property and unincorporated business tax. Corporate income tax is projected to yield 82.5 million, while the property tax is expected to yield 25.4 million. The unincorporated business tax is estimated to yield a paltry 7.1 million. Mr. Speaker, indirect taxes are expected to yield 664.1 million, which is about 85% of tax revenue. The main contributors to indirect tax revenue are the ABST, import duty, revenue recovery charge, and stamp duties. A total of 285.5 million or 43% of the revenue from indirect taxes will be generated from the ABST. Mr. Speaker, this represents a 6.2% increase over the ABST yield for 2019. Revenue from the import duty is budgeted at 101.4 million, while the revenue recovery charge is projected to yield 100.8 million. Revenue from stamp duties is expected to be 49.9 million in 2020, which is a 14% increase over the amount collected in 2019. Included in the category of indirect taxes are the tax and offshore banks, insurance levy, and the gambling tax. These taxes are forecast to yield $2 million, $5.6 million, and $2.2 million, respectively. Finally, the revenue from the travel tax is projected to be $7.2 million. Of the $237.8 million budgeted for non-tax revenue, $150 million represents NDF receipts from the Citizenship by Investment Program and $40 million of surplus funds from the Citizenship by Investment Unit. The amount budgeted for capital receipts is $5 million, while grant funding for fiscal year 2020 is budgeted at $90.9 million. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the budget allocations. I turn now to the expenditure allocations for 2020. The full details of all sums allocated to each ministry and the purposes for which they will be used are set out in the appendix. Parliament representatives will, with responsibility for ministries will present details of the programs to be executed in 2020 when they contribute to debate on this budget. However, I will now highlight the main allocations made in the budget of 2020. As stated earlier, the government will prioritize education as usual and will continue to do so in 2020. As such, the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology has the highest budgetary allocation in the amount of $151.6 million. Included in the allocation for this ministry is $18 million to support the UE5 Islands campus, and that is in addition to the $20 million that will be spent on capital expenditure to expand the campus. So we intend to spend $38 million on UE in this financial year. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment received the second largest allocation of $113.6 million. The Office of the Attorney General, Minister of Justice, or Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs, Public Safety and Labor has the third highest allocation at $108.6 million, which will be used to execute programs to enhance public safety, strengthen the justice system, and to pursue the government's legislative agenda. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Works will be allocated $84.5 million in Budget 2020 to continue to manage and maintain public infrastructure. And as I said before, we will ac accelerate the repairs of the public roads in 2020. The Ministry of Tourism and Economic Development is allocated $28.6 million in Budget 2020 to execute a strategy for the sector designed to deliver another year of stellar performance. In addition to the Ministry's allocation, is 3.5% of the ABST provided by the government for tourism promotion. Now, Mr. Speaker, allocations for the other ministries are as follows. Ministry of Information, Broadcasting, Telecommunications, and Information Technology. 
20.4 million. Ministry of Housing, Lands and Urban Renewal, 6.3 million. Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Trade and Immigration, 39.3 million. Ministry of Social Transformation, Human Resource Development, Youth and Gender Affairs, 28.6 million. Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Barbuda Affairs, 18.3 million. Ministry of Civil Aviation, Energy and Transportation, 9.2 million. Ministry of Sports, Culture, National Festivals and the Arts, 25.7 million. Mr. Speaker, the 2020 budget also includes allocations for the Office of the Governor General at 2.3 million, the Legislature at 2.3 million, the Cabinet at 4.1 million, the Judiciary at 2.3 million, the Service Commissions at 958,000, Audit at 1.3 million, Electoral Commission at 4.6 million, the Office of the Ombudsman, 364,000, Public Debt Payments at 613.8 million. Mr. Speaker, I take the opportunity now to speak of the allocations and their purpose for the Office of the Prime Minister, which is allocated 33.4 million, and the Ministry of Finance and Corporate Governance and Public-Private Partnerships, which is allocated $111 million. Included in the amount budgeted for these ministries is $16 million for the Prime Minister's scholarship program. The budget for the Ministry of Finance also includes an allocation of $6.5 million for the Barbuda Local Council, and emphasize $6.5 million and not $10 million. Mr. Speaker, the details of the programs of which these funds are earmarked are also in the appendix. However, I wish to highlight a few of the priorities for 2020. Optimizing revenue collection through increased automation at the Customs Division and Inland Revenue Department. Undertaking preparatory work for the 2021 Population Census. Reforming the National Procurement System for Improved Contract Management. Establishment the Governance Training and Development Fund and hosting the second annual Governance Training Workshop for public officials and advancing the work of the Oceans Governance Committee to ensure appropriate use and management of Antigua and Barbuda's, Barbuda's marine resources. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to capital expenditure. And by the way, we are coming to the end. Lots of things to report, so pardon the length of the budget. Mr. Speaker, the sum of $206.1 million has been allocated for capital expenditure. This is about 110 million more than the amount spent in 2019 and includes $18.7 million for the expansion and rehabilitation of schools. $74.5 million of the capital budget will be spent on the road development program and $14.2 million has been allocated for major repairs and maintenance of critical government buildings. I now speak to the issue of financing the budget. The budget has a financing requirement of $586.7 million. Our government will raise $275 million from the securities issued on the regional government securities market. And let me make the point here that those are debt that have been incurred already. What we'll do is that we will roll them over so it is not new debt. And Mr. Speaker, we will also issue government securities and we will issue development bonds and loans and advances of about $216.7 million. That is how we will fund the budget. And let me now conclude this budget statement. Mr. Speaker, one of the goals of development is to increase wealth for our countries and for their residents, businesses, and communities. And I know that there are some who have made mockery of the issue of wealth creation. And they have spun it to speak about the issue of creative enrichment. But the reality is we cannot build a nation and mockery. We cannot build wealth and mockery. As I said before, per capita income has climbed from 2,000 United States dollars in 1981 to almost $20,000 in 2020. And our country has advanced in the UN Human Development Index to the status of one with high human development. However, 
There remain pockets of poverty. Our government has established policies and programs to level the socioeconomic playing field, to create an egalitarian society, and to substantially reduce income inequality. These measures cause poverty to loosen its grip and the fist of destitu destitution to unclench. That is why for our government, they are being implemented steadfastly and unwaveringly. Mr. Speaker, release from abject conditions frees individuals from the pressing and suffocating needs of today and provides a space and relative comfort to contemplate and to build a sustainable future. A future where wealth is created, cultivated, and consolidated for oneself and for future generations. These are the conditions in which nations and certainly in which notions of intergenerational wealth are conceived and cemented. It is where the reality dawns that a most rewarding life requires economic, social, intellectual, physical, and spiritual wealth. Mr. Speaker, all these areas of wealth are needed since the absence of any undermines the efficacy of the others and the overall quality of life. So we are talking about the holistic development of the individual, including the spiritual development. Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering on our people's expectations. We're investing in our country's future, empowering our people through ownership, keeping our taxes low, and getting our debt down. That too is one of our most significant challenges, but it will take time. Now, Mr. Speaker, we must all pull together. We must pull together to build a bright and prosperous future that is within our nation's grasp. We must resolve to go forward, not backwards, and continue to build this nation of which we are all so proud and a country which we all so enduringly love. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I thank the Minister of State, the member for St. Philip's South. I thank all of my cabinet colleagues and certainly the members of the Ministry of Finance for their continued commitment to the goal of achieving growth and development for all in Antigua and Barbuda. I also take this opportunity to thank all the people of Antigua and Barbuda for the confidence and trust that they have reposed in my government. I take this opportunity now to commend this budget to this honorable house for its consideration. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.